Hello, Javed here. I play the rather unsavoury character of Chris Flynn in the podcast series Obeying Legends. It's another two parts of this week, so I will be back at the end to tell you about an exciting new project I will be auditioning for. Uh, but for now, like myself, relaxing here at my home in Wokingham, enjoy. Welcome to Urbane Legends, the podcast about urban legends and how to act in a courteous and refined manner, but much less about that. Here's your hosts, Neil and Chris. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Urbane Legends with me, the little-known fourth chuckle brother, Chris Flynn. And with me today, as always, is the man who produced not only The Rocketeer, but also Dick Tracy. It's Mr... Neil Herbert. Hi, Neil. How are you doing? Mr Golden Age of Comics himself. Um, Yeah, good, thank you. Good. Good. Um, So... How did you uh, how did you get interested in producing Hollywood films of uh, comics back in the early nineties? Well, as you know, I'm, I'm good friends with Warren Beatty, and he's, yeah. he's always been obsessed with Dick Tracy. Really? Um, and yeah, we just we just I saw a, you know an avenue to sort of make some money. And did you make it's, any money, or did you make a horrendous loss? It, it bombed horrifically. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean. I would have thought, you know, the charm of Warren Beatty, you know, the star power of Madonna, you know, yeah. Dick Tracy, yeah, you know, kids all kids all love a '30s tough guy, the gum, the gum shoe, a bit of chim music to a villain's <laughs> gallery, don't they? Yeah. Beating up some Irishmen. I thought it was a sure <laughs> party. Yeah, well, exactly. Um, well, they get up to no good otherwise, Chris. And so, uh, so when that didn't go, broom face and flat head and swamp man, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I am... characters. Iron Science. Yes. Now that's a different thing. Yes. Um, and so when that didn't go so well, you decided to double down on the Rocketeer. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the, the Rocketeer again. You know, Billy Zane. You know, in a purple suit. He used uh, to go out with one. a that's a Phantom. Isn't it? He used to go out with Kelly Brook, didn't he? Famously. I, do you know? I believe that's correct. I, yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten that. Are you and Zane not in t- contact anymore? No, no, we're not. Was it? He's a difficult character. <laughs> A different character. <laughs> after after the film bombed, he he, he very much uh, blamed you, didn't he, for for not publicising it correctly? He t- he he took it personally, yeah. And I think you know he, that star power, the wattage wasn't quite as great as both of us had thought. But I think yeah, he he felt I I was to blame for that. Yeah, um, but you were you were you were quite acerbic with him, weren't you? <laughs> you were saying you were sort yeah. of saying along the lines of, "Look, it's not my fault that." You're not quite the the man that you think you are, Zane. Yeah, no. no like, it ended, ended, like, like, ended, want... ended up if, in a bit of pushing and shoving, didn't it? If you want to get them out and compare, or compare, <laughs> I'll tell you what, you're the one who's going to run home crying to mum. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> that was the words I think I literally came out with. And, uh, you know. Yeah, well. Um, you had nothing to say to that. Well. All of a sudden, there's a, all of a, sudden there's a grudge. Well. I don't get work in Hollywood anymore. Well, do you know what? Like, it's it's he's a prima donna, isn't he? If he can't just just because he's the bad guy in Titanic, if he's not willing to suddenly, if he's not willing to get his, yeah, he's not willing to get out and measure. That's what a meritocracy is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see, we'll just tape measure, tape measure. And we all know where we stand. Crab position. <laughs> um, don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm not bragging. I just. I just don't think he's got much much to shout about either. So no, pants for my chances. Well, uh, the, the smug look on his face belies the scared little boy underneath, doesn't it? <laughs> exactly. You know. um, I've been watching some TV this week, Neil, because you know I'm a, a TV aficionado. Um, you certainly are. I, I, good. I binged watched uh, The Chestnut Man on Netflix, which is, um, oh, okay. which is a Nord, like a Nordic drama thing. And what it's about, right, it's about this... Um, this guy who's kind of in the Danish version of the SAS and, okay. and he, he fakes his own death because he wants out, but you know, you can't get out. It's like that kind of thing. And then he goes, it's not, not exactly like the SAS. Then I, I believe they've got a slightly different. Well, it's kind of like SAS, CIA, you know, spy, okay, yeah. you know, tough guy, spy stuff. 
Um, and so he fakes his own death, and then he goes and lives in in the forests. And uh, when he's there, he finds an enchanted chestnut tree, which I believe was enchanted mm. by a troll. And what he finds is that when he eats one of the chestnuts, he himself becomes made of chestnuts. And so, so he... Ta- but bulletproof as the chestnut tree is. Exactly. And uh, so he um, he goes and uh, fights fights organised crime in the back streets of Copenhagen. Um, it's not for kids. Don't get... Like, you know, it sounds like it is. It's, okay. not, like it, it's ultra-violent. The violence is yeah. kinetic and bloody. But, um, but can he shape like his arms into spears and things like? No, like he no tree? no. Basically, his fist is like a chestnut, and then his arms are several chestnuts. He's like just basically okay. like an anthropomorphic sort of chestnut. Um, and then basically, the bad guys find out about the tree, and then he has to go and defend it. And um, and then try and roast him then. Well, the, yeah, that's that's one of the torture scenes in it, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, the, they roast his chestnuts. Yeah, the bad. The, he's he's trying to be. He ends up getting to the head of the gang, who's called Mister Christmas. Um, yeah. But then at the end of it, it turns out that Mister Christmas is working for someone else who's bigger. So that's you know, and then it says the end question mark. So I think there's going to be a second series. I'm looking forward to. Oh, that. Okay, so, so it sounds like there's a bit of subtle subtext going on there, Chris. Mister Christmas sounds innocuous on the face of it, but I think yeah, you know, it's... well, exactly, exactly. And he's got yeah, he's he has got a big white beard. Is he a, is he a wise cracking villain? No, 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 not at all. He's a complete psychopath. Oh, okay. Complete psychopath. Yeah. He um he he feeds feeds by, by Danny tra- by the by the Danish Danny, Danny Trejo by any chance? Yes, that's right. And he um yeah. whoever that would be. He feed he feeds people to reindeers and stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah, into bottled sun. I mean, I would I would say I say to everyone watch it, but only if you're not squeamish, because yeah. as I've said, it is ultra violent. Just a TV show, though, isn't it, Chris? Just a TV show. I mean, yeah, but I mean, even I, I, you know, I, I found myself throwing up several times. You're physically sick. <laughs> yeah. I was. I was physically sick yeah. at some of the scenes, you know, and I've and I've seen some pretty moody stuff on the dark. Do you know, that's always a, that's a sign of a good horror movie. You know, if you're in a cinema full of people who are throwing up over themselves, you know, yeah. you've seen a good film. That's, 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 that's a good experience. Yeah, <laughs> paramedics being sent in. <laughs> yeah, you don't get that much these People days. To get you? defibrillated, <laughs> kind of footage movies. Yeah, um, yeah. So um, there you go. There's my uh, my TV recommendation for the oh, week. Oh, piss and shit myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, murder on cinema furniture. There you go. Yeah. So what? Watch it, but keep um, keep a, a, a cold compress and a bucket nearby. That's what I'd say. Uh, so, Neil, I believe you're driving this week, Urban Legend, and it is yes. from all of our right. spiritual homes, Africa. Indeed it is. So, um, specifically, the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Lovely. Congo. Um, yeah, so and Congo's... See, people don't know a lot about African history because we're not taught it, but Congo's... Like the, the sort of the kingdom of Congo, it's fucking ancient. It's well ancient. They were they were a sort of well advanced civilization trading with the Portuguese and speaking Portuguese, and some of them turned Catholic back in the sixteenth mm. century. So they mm. were they were seen as trading partners, as equals. Yeah, and then you got you get pictures from. Portugal from medieval times of Congolese emissaries walking around in their finery. Mm. Yeah, just thought I'd, I'd, I'd throw that in there, a bit of African history, because people tend, exactly. tend to exactly. think of it just as mud huts. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, absolutely not. So, um, yeah, those Portuguese did get about, didn't they? Yeah, they were the original Not, not always for better. Of, yeah. Yeah, so Democratic Republic of Congo. So um, Portugal, you know, of course, people, England's oldest ally. There you go. Just thought I'd add. Oh, the Portuguese. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was it treaty going back to fourteenth century or thirteenth century? I yeah. Can't remember. Um. Yeah. There we go. A bit of history there for everyone. So you've got TV recommendations, history, barely remembered history. Neil, yeah. I've just, I've just remembered. I've not given you any etiquette tips. 
I was going to say, yeah, you, you usually do like to start out with an etiquette tip, but uh, we'll do it so feel free to uh, feel free to roll one of those out before I start um, or launch into the, um, the story. Okie dokie. So DLC. we're gonna we're gonna go to China today. Okay, the big country with a big heart. Um. So, okay, so I'm just gonna. I'm just going to read you a bit here, uh, Mm -hmm. and it's just general etiquette in China, okay? Fair enough. So Chinese people are just as proud, if not prouder, of their countries as visitors are of theirs. Well, it's not not difficult to be more proud of your country than I am of ours, to be honest. (laughs) They can understandably become a little irritated when visitors favour with criticisms of China. Would you be happy to hear criticisms of your home country? Yes. Chinese people already know that not everything's perfect and they also know that they, like other countries, are working hard to deal with the issues such as the environment and population. Discussions regarding politics, state leaders, recent history and issues pertaining to Taiwan, Jiangxing and Tibet are still seen as sensitive topics and should be avoided. Okay, Neil? I think that's fair enough as a tourist. I think, you know, you can... Well, this place is... (laughs) If somebody brings it... (laughs) If somebody brings it up, then I think you're entitled to have your opinion about sort of, you know, Taiwan or whatever it might be. But um, yeah, I think shoehorning that into a conversation is pretty rude. So yeah, you know, I, I agree. Don't, I don't see why you'd need to. I think it seems it doesn't seem like a topic that <laughs> you'd have to bring it up, wouldn't you? Well, you've cho- you've chosen to visit that country, so if you if your opinion is that strong, yeah, then don't, why, you yeah, know, fuck why off. visiting really. <laughs> And if, if you if you are, then, um, you know, I think, yeah, it seems reasonably. I would say if it comes up in discussion, someone asks you your opinion, then I think you're entitled to, to, to say what you think. Yeah. Okay. So here's one which is slightly more left field to us. Mm-hmm. Never write in red ink. Red ink is a symbol of protest and criticism and best safe for teachers correcting students' homework. Another reason as to why you should never write in red ink, particularly when writing someone's name, is that red ink is used to mark the names of criminals condemned to death on official records. And right well, then- what if I'm what if I'm tutoring some uh, soon to be executed criminals about about the history of revolution? They've done some placards, but I need to just give them some pointers. Uh, I think you just have to judge each case on its merits at that point. Yeah, I mean, to play it by ear. Yeah. I don't. Th- I don't think that fits yeah. into the general the general rules. Bit of a niche case, would you say? Fair enough. Yeah, although I know that you have been you have been sending a lot of applications to Chinese yeah. prisons to, to use your TEFL qualification, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, well, I just you know, I, I, you know, <laughs> alongside my revolutionary Marxist beliefs, so if I combine those two together, then I'll be all the happier. So it doesn't go down that well, I'll be honest with you, but (laughs) quite for what you believe in. Red is also used to write their name on tombstones. So, you know, you know forever. Need another reason? Red ink is sometimes used to convey bad news, such as someone passing away or a breakup letter. Oh, is that why you keep sending me those dear Johns in red ink? Well, that, 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 it's not red ink, it's blood. (laughs) (laughs) I'd say where it comes from. The best thing you could do is avoid using red ink altogether. The last thing you want to do is upset your new friends by writing them a thank you letter in red ink. <laughs> imagine, oh. imagine Neil, imagine the consternation. Oh, I've made a, I've made a right little howler, and then I've, I've mixed up the. Um, oh, it's not Kanji, is it? What's the system in uh, in China? I've forgotten. Don't um, don't know. Good. Um, so, um, anyway, the, the symbol, the symbol for friendship, with the one for you're a wanker. <laughs> <laughs> one of those hilarious comedic premises that you always get somebody <laughs> learning <laughs> in his translation. That's one of the ones which my um, which my what did you say about my wife. <laughs> oh, I was just, I was just complimenting you on your superb wardrobe, sir. <laughs> my wife is a what? The deal is off. <laughs> oh no! What have I done? <laughs> I will better sit down and write him a, a sorry letter in red ink. I've only got, I've only got red, red ink. And, yeah, that's all right. That's not going to be a problem. Surely there couldn't be any misunderstanding under the colour of the ink. Do 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 do. Um, so oh. this one is oh. in stark contrast to our etiquette um, about India, and it's around punct- okay. it's around punctuality. Got to be careful, aren't you? It's like this you know, is the, why the, these the lessons are important. Simple. The thumbs up symbol is kind of like, um, you know, that's quite offensive, I believe, in parts of South America. Is it? And yeah, it means like up your ass sort of thing. How's that? Um, so, yeah. That's what I. That's what I do. That's what I mean when I do it in English. <laughs> what you're thinking? Yeah, it's, it's yeah, a compliment. Okay. 
Yeah. I'm being friendly. I know. I know. I'd like. No, I'd like. It. I'd yeah. Like it. Um, yeah, and apparently some people have taken the OK sign and turned that into some kind of Nazi salute. So thanks for that. Pious and tires and fucking all right wankers. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, soon waggling your eyebrows is going to be considered. Well, this is the thing. Yeah, it's because like, I really can't be bothered to follow social media and all the rest of it to find out about these trends. I'm just going to inadvertently like shake someone's hand and then find out it's like some. <laughs> Tribute to some Norwegian mass murderer or something. <laughs> Just stole the handshake. Um, right. Punctuality is considered a virtue in China, despite the fact that Chinese people are, on average, 10 minutes late for their engagements. Being on time is, is a sign of respect towards others. Chinese people may show up earlier to show their earnestness, but be wary of the situation. Showing up early to a meal you're invited to can be considered impolite, as it may give the impression that you're hungry and eager to eat. How's that bad for a meal? Well, I don't know where I don't know I don't know where I am then. I was going to say I was just thinking actually I'm going to be on sweet spot there because I'll be turning up on time as is my want, and um, you know and then and they'll be turning up a bit late. So you know I'll be sort of quids in etiquette wise. But uh, oh no, it turns out it was for a meal, and I've and I've given myself a little red ink tattoo on my forehead as well. <laughs> being on, being on well. time. For your tour or any other time shows, respect to the guys and fellow travellers. So what I'm hearing here is I just think that's a general good rule. Just, just basically turn up on time. But don't turn yeah. but don't turn up early for a meal. Uh, that's what I'm hearing. I think, well again, it's like turning up early for a party, isn't it? You don't do that. I do. I turn up a day early. Yeah. And it's, insist on staying <laughs> over. Um Yeah, okay. So there you go, Neil. So that was some quite useful etiquette, I think. This week, you... I, th- I think I'll, I think I'll be all right with all of those because I don't write in red ink. I don't, you know, don't, don't tend to write too many letters. Full stop. These you days, can't write, can you? No, you can only can't. type. What with these? What with these fingers? <laughs> <laughs> you just type. Don't write. It's weird, isn't it? Because yeah. I find when I have to actually physically write stuff now, my hand cramps up quite easy compared to when I was at school because I'm used to just typing everything. Yeah, no, absolutely. If I had to go back and do like essays and stuff, or, I mean, we used to do exams and you'd be like three hours writing with a pen. Mm. Well, I expect to have done on laptops these days, Chris. Yeah, I bet. Uh, don't, don't I? Yeah. These we, millennials. Just voice DMs, recognition, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, just, we just started for them, doesn't yeah, it? Like Johnny Mnemonic or something. Yeah. Three questions about how woke you are, and then it gives you a first time. I assume. You all know a man. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Google just does it for me. That's the real world now. <laughs> so. Okay, I, I was wondering because obviously work's really boring, right? Yeah, obviously. Um, so all work doesn't matter what it is. Um, yeah. Except podding, that's not boring. That's all right. And any any ex, any expensive yeah, editing's boring. Really. Right? Um, yeah. I mean, most of it's pretty dull. I'm, I'm bored to tears right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. I'll get through it. Um, I was like, you know, it, is there a clever way that you could make some kind of algorithm to mean that you could play a really good game, but it was also doing your work somehow. Don't know. I don't think many firms are going to invest in that kind of technology to be with you, Chris. <laughs> Satisfaction of the workforce not necessarily being the top priority for many organisations. Yeah, that's true. Oh well, it's just a little. No, it depends. Depends on your work as well, doesn't it? I mean, if it was something that an algorithm could do, hot carrier. <laughs> You've, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, if it's something physical, I was just thinking like some poor chap and Amazon pissing in a bottle because they've got, you know, get X amount of packages out or whatever, um, then their shift or um, or hot carry, as you say. Um, yeah, but delivery, do that. delivery and if it's, jobs will be... If it's office-based stuff... Delivery jobs then, will be um, out. There, there won't be any in 10 years, will there? So. Yeah, I don't know if it'll be that quick, to be honest with you. 10 or 15 well, years. It'll be drones. It'll, be, it'll just, you know, it'll be an electric... Ve- it'll be an electric vehicle and it lets you know on an app that it's outside and you go up and it just drops it into a slot and you take it, I would imagine, something like that. Why's well, it got machine guns on the side, Amazon? <laughs> well, you're not saying. Well, because, <laughs> because we've run because we've run out of natural gas and we have no food. So so people will try and raid it. Yeah. So you know. Um I'm be honest with you, we'll sign up to that as well. We'll be like fair enough. Mm. Vote it in. A few dead neighbours if we can keep up the Amazon delivery. Vote it in. Vote them not in. Going down, not going down the high street anymore. What the fuck do you think I am? This is Buck Rogers fucking from time. I was thinking about this the other day, the whole um, uh, high street like beds because you can get stuff delivered now. 
for, because of the internet. But you could always get stuff. I know it's much more prevalent, but you could always get stuff delivered from the catalogue. It's just that, isn't it? But <laughs> bigger. Oh yeah, but it's much more. It's much more convenient there, isn't it? But I mean, it's a. I mean, I do understand. You know, I, I, I understand shopping locally and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, we're in a unfortunately ultra capitalist society. So surely the fact that people just want stuff delivered. That's you know that's what's going to do. Well, actually, my my hope, and it's you know probably just being overly. Yeah, there we optimistic. go. Oh, dreamy dream boy. Oh, the dream yeah. boat Neil yeah. Herbert dreaming away yeah. on his every, little, every dream on his little dream. cloud made of rainbows, right? Yeah. And unicorns. Yeah, yeah good. Um, <laughs> no, because I think no, 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 because uh, yeah, 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 and all of that. No, I I think. Um, Potentially, you know, what could happen? Because you think about it, the high street got, you know, originally you'd have like small local shops. Yeah. And then it got all took over by sort of the big chains. Yeah. Which now, you know, when people talk about the death of the high street, but actually it's just that a lot of the big chains are sort of going out of business because other bigger chains have consolidated on them um, and had more efficient ways of channeling stuff out. But I think, you know, what you might see is more sort of, in, again, independent business. Do you think that we, up. do you think? Do you know, there's, there's, a, there's a fucking one of the best ranked, um, where, near where I work, Trafalgar Street, um, and it slightly infuriates me, but good luck to the, the lady who runs it. There's a fucking Harry Potter shop. Ugh. And they sell wands and buttered beer and what? You know, all this nonsense. But do you know what? I mean, it's gone down a storm with people. He's top rated on TripAdvisor. He's getting, making money under the fist, I suspect. Well, good. I mean, yeah. Not, not, not for him, me, you know. but I mean, do you, do, do you think. Exactly. Local, you know, he's going to spend that money locally. Do you think that there's, there's much more of the market that we can saturate to open up? More vape shops and secondhand mobile phone shops to to, re, to replace all of the current businesses. Firstly, the vape shops need to go inside the pound shops to make that more efficient, <laughs> um, and, and also all the mobile phone repair. Um, yeah, well, that, and, I mean, that in no the, way are vape shops or those secondhand mobile phone shops a way to launder money. In no way at all. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that is the one thing I suppose. Living in Brighton, we're probably a bit more blessed in that you get get more of a kind of like. I mean. I don't know how many more coffee shops can be opened. Oh, I mean, actually, probably quite a few. I went along Western Road on the bus the other day, and um, it's pretty depressing. Although pretty much what they're doing is they... It's turned into London Road now. Yeah, and London... That used to be my like barometer for London, slightly depressing. You know, you'd have like three-pound shops within walking distance And London Road turned into Beirut. No, <laughs> No, London Road's probably doing as well. London, as well. London Road in the nineties, mate, used to be a lot worse. I know, mate. I was here. Skagheads knocking about. Yeah. Um, no, Western Road. Really, but what seems to have happened is just loads of like every shop is now turning into a cafe or an eatery. So I don't know. I don't know how sustainable any of it is. None of us know what's going to happen. So we don't. But I think you know, there's an opportunity there for people to start their own businesses. So you know, good luck to them. And if you're, you know. Yeah, but I don't. I'm, I'm not going there. I don't like walking into town. It gives me panic attacks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how, how well things will recover after COVID remains to be seen, I guess. But uh, well, that shoves a spanner in the works. But yeah, I don't know. I, you know, you, you kind of hope is, is that some of the. I mean, high streets sort of evolve more into sort of like smaller, you know, more independent businesses. Maybe, maybe not. And speaking, speaking of That's all of that nonsense, now capitalism and trade. That brings us nicely back to the Congo, where uh, where I believe at least it's where our, some where of our, our stories from some of our reports are from. I believe some are from Zaire as well. Um, well, that's the old name for the um, DRC, isn't it? So you, no, Zaire is its own country. Uh, yeah, it okay, is. I'm going to check that. I'm going to fact check that because I think Zaire nope. is the old name. Incorrect. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sure I'm wrong, but. Uh... So according to Wiki, I can't always trust Wiki, but they're usually good and stuff like this. Zaire, officially the Republic of Zaire, was the name of the sovereign state between 71 and 97 in Central Africa that was previously and is now again known as the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Zaire, officially Republic of Zaire. Uh, oh, right. Oh, that's weird. There you go. Oh, how weird. I thought, because uh, there is still Congo as well, which is different. Oh, okay. I didn't realise that. Well done, Neil. I thought Zaire was still a legitimate country. I wasn't one hundred percent, but um, no, yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, so D- DRC is the point now, and uh, yeah, no, and I think there, there was one I was looking at earlier that was, um, but it's a different one. We'll come to another week that, that was spread over different ones, but this one seems to be um, seems to very much be around this part of Africa. So this is um, a bit of African folklore called. Um, so it's a creature called the Biloko. Mm-hmm. 
or the singular is Eloco. So Beloco is kind of like the collective name for these entities. Or if, if you see one of them, and good luck with that, if you do, um, then it's Eloco. Um, My parent is called uh, Moloco. <laughs> like the band. He, yeah, they had one or two good tunes, mm. as I recall. The time is now. There was, what was the one, was it? Um, that was a sex boy. That was there. There was, um, oh, I can't remember. I just remember is that the, um, the guitarist was sort of like quite short and gothic and they had like a huge drummer. You know, it was about eight foot behind that kid. Oh, bring it no, back. One. Swing it back. Bring it back. Bring it back to me. Sing it back. Oh, I, I think I'm thinking of a different band. I think, right? Let's not get into nineties pop. Nope. Oh. Um, right, the Beloco. Go in loco. So it's a down with the Beloco. It's a forest. A, a for uh, going loco down in DRC. Um, eighties pop now. So right, let's start again. So a fascinating piece of folklore, the African constant, uh, is the tales of the Beloco, a forest dwelling army of vicious dwarves. So they're part of the mythology of the Mongo people in the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and so just looking, just doing a bit of um, reading here from a, a, an article on Face to Face Africa, Chris, mm-hmm. um, just to give a shout out. So they're also in tune, apparently, with astrological observations that the folklores tend to mimic creators' environments. Yeah, so um, just in the case of. So, I mean, this could be kind of a memory back to, you know, like pygmies, that kind of thing, or. You know, they found those really tiny humans somewhere in Indonesia or um, Papua New Guinea or something. They found the skeletons of these humans that died out maybe a couple mm. of thousand years ago, but they were really so they were they were hominids, but they were really small. So it could be okay. it could be a memory yeah, because pygmies. Um, whereabouts are they? They're a specific sort of um, for, that's um, tribe. I think they're a different part of Africa. Aren't I think they, pygmies I think. are Papua New Guinea. I thought they were. Um... African, but it could be uh, again. Oh, actually, so well, that's an interesting one, yeah, because they are hunter gatherers of the Congo Basin. Oh, there you go. So, yeah, who knows? An adult male of a pygmy is about five foot one, so that's pretty small. Yeah, and then Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, and the DRC. Yeah, they are in, are in them. Um, so, who, yeah, maybe, maybe there is, it doesn't mention it in the article here, but yeah, who knows? Yeah, and so, um. But it's it's an interesting bit of folklore because it's uh you know it's it seems to be th- this particular one the Beloco seems to be unique to the um to the DRC um, which is about the size of Europe and, anyway <laughs> it's huge. yeah absolutely yeah and so an Aloco is believed to be the lingering spirit of an ancestor and their vengeful spirit is scores to settle in the world of the living ah oh, nice bit scores to settle you, you don't want you don't want to mess with these these chaps I don't believe you um, owed me a tenner when I died. I've got a few scores to sell. I wonder how petty these scores could get. Um, I mean, I, 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 I heard some of the Eloco sent letters to Robert the Doll, so I mean, pretty petty. <laughs> I hope they're respectful in their in their letter writing. <laughs> send send them plenty of cocaine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, listen to our Robert the Doll podcast if you don't understand what that is. But uh, he, he 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 loves being sent some ironic gifts. Or he likes being sent stuff which the staff also happen to like. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so, yeah, money, candy, cocaine, spliffs, anything like that. Please forward on to Robert the Dull. Um, or, you know, it will take, take, take into the rainforest of, of the, um, the Congo. Well, he's got his little sailor's outfit on, so he'd be, he'd be all right to make the journey, wouldn't he? Yeah. He'd fit in with the Navy, wouldn't he? That'd be, that'd be fine. <laughs> We want you. We want you as a new recruit. I don't know how well he'd he'd work out in the rainforest though. Yeah, the damp. But I mean, he is haunted. Yeah. So, what happens? What happens though when the the uh, the vessel for, for the haunting is sort of like? Well, he probably gets damp and mouldy and falls he'd apart. He'd probably be about the same size as the Aloko as well, wouldn't he? Because he was yeah. um, a life sized child doll, and these ones are tiny. Yeah. So. I don't recall whether he was a particularly vengeful spirit, but what, uh, I think you just you know you didn't you didn't want to cross him. Yeah. Anyway, look, this is not about Robert the Robert Everything's the Dull. Everything's about Robert um, the Dull. It all comes back to Robert the Dull. This is very much the Robert the Dull universe <laughs> that we're crafting here. Um, <laughs> Everything like a spider's web spins out from Robert the Dull. Yeah, he's like the Moriarty <laughs> of uh, the urban legends mythos. 
tend towards him in the middle. Um, so in different African myths, um, certain reasons can keep the spirit of an own sister out of the world in which it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. So for instance, if one was murdered yeah. or died in a terrible accident or not even properly buried, that their spirits could linger. So that seems fair enough. Yeah. If you've been murdered, I imagine you're going to have a <laughs> just, or, you know. Not properly buried, like just really. <laughs> just put some leaves just yeah, put that, some leaves on him. No one likes him. Do you know what? Six foot. <laughs> I don't know. Just, just cover, just, just give them a thin, a thin covering of soil. Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, but the animals will have at it. You know, as long as we get something out there, that's you know, just get them out. Just get them out of the village. Be one of those. Um, you know, you see, you see, you see it in films where they just have like um, just cover someone in rocks. Yeah, it's a lazy way to bury someone, isn't it? Well, I think they tend to do that in the desert, don't they? Because presumably they don't have a shovel, or the desert's quite. Quite hard to dig in because of it. Oh yeah, that would be quite quite difficult work, I suppose. And um, yeah, all the sand shifting around. So that that that's his way out of. And he'd be be better preserved. When I, I guess, when so I yeah. die, I want to be covered in pebbles in the from the beach in the. It, I was going to say, in, yeah, that, in, that, that in, would in be in the centre of Churchill Square. <laughs> Brighton Beach gets enough of a mess at the moment as it is with various things happening down and people leaving litter and stuff. Yeah, if just, people start leaving corpses, that's going to get. Oh. You know, we're, we're, that's part of our um, policy with having a, a green council. Oh, yeah, exactly. Do you know what the Greens have probably loved that? <laughs> oh, oh no, some old pe- old people don't like corpses washing up on Brighton Beach. And, you know, having to trip and over all the corpses on the beach. Well, you know, it's different people have got different ways of living. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. This is my hum- my that's humanist way of going. I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. have a thin <laughs> covering of pebbles, pebbles, pebbles. on top of me and. The, uh, you know, at night the seagulls can have that. Well, that's the thing, is, isn't it? You know, within seconds, the seagulls are just going to. But have I mean, I've eaten enough chicken in my life that it's probably yeah. a poetic justice that I get eaten by, yeah, by a you know carrier, carrier bird. Enough. I wouldn't. I wouldn't sort of have a big problem with yeah seagulls. You know, if you're dead, you're dead. You it's like a, it's, it's like ideal. A... I'd have a Viking Viking funeral. You know, just like a um, a longboat going out with like a, a, a funeral. I could do. But I haven't, I haven't earned that kind of an exit in any way, shape. I or could fashion, do you a rubber so. dinghy covered in petrol if that if that worked for you. You just people could just fling like big, big lights of cocktails, it, <laughs> set it ablaze. It's just, just a really violent waste. <laughs> people just heaving yeah. Molotov cocktails at your corpse, which is in a dinghy ten foot off the off the beach. Well, I could sell tickets. One actually, that would be quite good. <laughs> Did you see there was uh, yeah or. If you just fill me, fill, <laughs> I just like fill me with C four, and then do like a trebuchet and just launch me into the air over Brighton Beach and then fire me up. an arrow into you while you're going. Yeah, well, whatever. You fill you, um, fill you with um, uh, fireworks, so you go out with yeah, a yeah. beautiful bang, and, and when it blows yeah. up, then it it's um, it does a big American red, white, and blue flag. <laughs> that would be even better. Yeah, I just want maximum coverage, basically. Just a splatter as much of the beach. So actually, oh. trebuchet you from the beach into the town. <laughs> oh, yeah, that could work as well. Yeah. Into um, the lanes. yeah, Maybe over sort of Churchill Square or something. Yeah, all the lanes. Yeah, that'd be good. Ah, good. Well, um, just I've noted go. that all down for... That's, um, that's my last will and testament. If you go before me. And if that, if that doesn't happen, I'm going to turn into an aloko right. and uh, there'll be some hauntings to come, or, or, or whatever the Brighton equivalent is. Um so there are also cases so we talked about those um you know in african myths you can you know you can have the spirit of an ancestor um you know uh, not not going going across peacefully to the afterlife because they're murdered or something like that so giving them a reason to be a vengeful that's spirit. Quite standard but isn't it also that's where standard they, globally yeah yeah i'd say i'd say that's that's pretty um pretty standard uh, to sort of uh yeah kind of folklore and mythology that you have here as well sort of certainly pre-christian um, and there are cases as well, apparently, where spirits, is, again, this is not dissimilar to, to what you might um, see in Europe and stuff, but uh, in America, you know, where spirits have certain things they want to complete in the land of the living. They want to stick around to help a relative or friend to do. So I don't, I think this is more just kind of like African folklore rather than specifically what's creating the below code because they seem to be more venture I would, spirits. Um, just two um, things. I'd like to say, sorry if you can hear any rumbling or noise in the background. Uh, the people upstairs are doing something to the flat. Um, so if it's picking up on that, sorry. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say is, did you see uh, that in the British Museum they have discovered on an ancient Babylonian fresco or, te- or tablet 
the first ever drawing of a ghost. I believe that you were you were part of that team, Neil, weren't you? You went in there with your divining rods. Yeah, I I mean, at my insistence, due to the amount of funding that I've given them, I uh, I insisted on bringing along a PKE meter, divining rods, PKE meter, and you the divining rod, PKE meter, and um and a petri dish for collecting. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't need any of these devices, as it turns out. But, but yeah, yeah, so but you managed to find head. the earliest earliest ever picture of a ghost, Neil. So um, yet again, yeah. proving your credentials as England's foremost spiritualist. Yeah, I'm very much in the UK's Zach <laughs> Bagley. I believe his name, I believe his name is, without the frosted tips and the uh, sunglasses on the back of the head. I must which he saying. which he uses regular so that he can walk into rooms backwards to trick ghosts. Exactly. <laughs> Then they then they haunt <laughs> the back, and then you, you haunt the back of someone's head. That's fine. You don't, you know yeah. that that the, the spirits don't get yeah. at you. <laughs> well, I think he took that one from Jason and the magician, right. wasn't it? That's okay. He's... Yeah, he put he had some. He wasn't a mirror. He had some sunglasses yeah. on the back of his head, and then the magician tried to turn that into stone. <laughs> use up, use he got out his mirror. Use up all his stone power, and then while it was yeah. all puffed out, he chopped its head off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I believe that was the story, and the uh, yeah the the acid blood frosted his tips, <laughs> which which he's left there yeah. as as a reminder of how rat he is exactly. And then King Pelagius was like, oh, this, <laughs> Whoa, this guy's so dude. <laughs> Whoa, oh, radical, <laughs> um, or, or possibly that was an eighties movie. I can't remember one or the other. Oh, that that or ancient Greek mythology. Um, Same yeah, thing. Probably both. Dylan's head was largely the, based the, on uh, the, the, uh, it was, the Odyssey, wasn't very it? Much so. And of course, I, I right, anyway, know where our so, was based on uh, the Iliad. Yeah. So this is uh, so the article telling us that it's not akin to the Catholic idea of purgatory. So apparently, it's quite rare to find in African cultures um, adjudication of people's lives in the afterworld. So it's not a case of. Um, you know, the spirits need to do something in order to go Chosen on to the next to phase. Around, do a bit of haunting. Yeah. You know, he just... They, 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 there's, there's less of a sort of judgment area, apparently, which is nice. Um, well, again, that's, away. that's a anyway. very Abrahamic thing, isn't it? And yes. Well, yeah. I say that, but, uh, but then they probably got it from the ancient Egyptians where you would weigh your heart against a feather. Weigh the soul or whatever it was, wouldn't they? Yeah. What are you doing there, Neil? Having a boogie? I mean, uh, no... Uh, my back's a bit. Sorry, I did say if I step up okay. and down, then uh... right. So <laughs> we finally get to the point. The Baloko live in the darkest, most dense parts of the forest in hollow trees. They're covered in leaves, but one can see their soul-piercing ah, eyes, like Moss Man. There's a uh... yeah. Well, there's there's a picture here. Or um, Parsley the Lion. Very yeah. It looks. It just kind of looks like yeah. It's some sort Woodlands. of I don't know, Lord of the Ringsy type character. So it's, a, it's a red fella with sort of. White spirals. So are they kind of like? Because you know, there's the shoulders. ancient thing of the green man, which is like the forest bloke um... coming to life, like predator. <laughs> well, the green man is um, in, in. It's like a very ancient pagan thing, but it kind of carried on, and he's carved into quite a lot of churches. It's like about yeah, it's okay. like um, a, a, the man of the forest who's like made of leaves and stuff. Yeah, which is a sort of um, a metaphor for nature, I suppose, isn't it? Um, which is probably fairly similar here. So, yeah, they've got no hair, and, and although dwarfish, they have mouths big enough to swallow a fully killed human being. Yeah, good luck with me. Good luck yeah, with same. me. Yeah, <laughs> um, But they, they can have you dead or alive owing to their shit. You know, I, I mean, and they love, you love can have as big a mouth flesh. as you want, mate, but, you know, how your stomach's going to have to be pretty big to devour me, you know, considering you're a wee lad. Unless they've got like a stomach that sticks out and they carry it in a wheelbarrow, like that um, character from Viz who had the massive gonads. <laughs> Push it around. I remember that one. Probably called oh, like Jeremy Nash or something. Or something. Yeah, I remember Viz. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so they, they've also got small bells and they can cast bells. spells and pass the Even Yeah. So apparently this is a big thing bells. for magic. You, um, oh, you can okay. use bells for enchantment. Um, and you know they'll 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 basically go after whoever they fancy. They just they just love the taste of human flesh. So they're thought to to guard the treasures of the forest, usually animals mm. and the rarest fruits. And only the bravest of hunters mm. can hunt D- in these parts of the forest. Dare you approach the kumquat? We'll need magic charms. 
what uh yeah with, uh, what i was trying to think what trend dragon, kind of like fruit, no, would, fruit. Would be actually now yeah i don't and know you what the can latest craze is thing called kiwi berries um, now which are like which are but like like oh, really? grape size but you buy it into them and it's a kiwi fruit but you can eat the skin and stuff that they've just eat a kiwi fruit, to be honest with you. What, what um, do you mean? Like hassle. Hassle. It's clearly more yeah. hassle. You have to eat a kiwi fruit like an egg, whereas these you just eat them like grapes. They just slice well, it in half. How's that less hassle than just eating it? Fair enough. No, do you know what I mean? I mean, like the sourcing them and all of that sort of thing. Because I, I mean, I remember when kiwi fruits were the hot thing. Yeah, in the late eighties. Everyone had t-shirts with rare. kiwi fruits on. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We used to, you know, have a kiwi fruit <laughs> slice over each eye. <laughs> really stung. <laughs> oh, yeah, because you couldn't you couldn't afford too many of them. To be honest, there was like five pound a pop bag in those days. So you you know rotting away by the time you were sort of getting. I don't mind the kiwi fruit. Um, I'm not mad on them. I like kiwi fruit. I haven't had one for a while actually. Mind me, I have to sort myself. I was I was reading some an article actually because um, obviously a lot of them are grown in New Zealand, but um, there's a particular strain of kiwi fruit that's selling really well at the moment. I think it's like a golden something or another. Um, it's a mm. particular colour that. It's supposed to be especially tasty or what have you, I don't know. Um, and, yeah, I think um, it's a bit of those ones where they're having a bit of a trade war with China because, um, well, a bit like where we stole silk um, during the Silk Road years. Um, stole a silk was a silk from the Chinese and all the well, was Portuguese and Italians did first, but then sort of came over into Europe. Um, yeah, they've taken sort of like the... Uh, some of these uh, kiwi fruits and they're, they're growing them in. So I think I think it's Bellops. a strain that they've actually. Um, what do you mean? Yeah, copyright. they've they developed and they've actually. Um, yeah, I don't know. It would be copyright or I'm not sure what the sort of legal term would be, but basically they they have the um, they have a sort of legal right to grow them if you like. But then there's it, it's sort of farms in China where they're sort of growing these themselves and sort of selling them internally, which sort of people turn a, a blind eye towards. And then it's a bit, a bit of fun. I don't I don't know what the point of that no, story right. is. Chris, I mean, I, it's a weird it's something one. Something I read, because, and you know, I can un, you know you d- you develop you know you cross pollinating plants and all that kind of shit to make these new things like nectarines or kiwi berries or whatever. Yeah. Well, they invest yeah, in quite a lot of money I mean, to make these things. Day, um, yeah, someone gets hold of the seeds. You know what you're going to do? Like, you know, I don't. I, I'm not sure that I care that much, really. No, no, I kind of agree. I guess it's just you know, if it had been like a much smaller country, then obviously New Zealand would have, um, you know, probably enforced it in the court of law. But I don't really want to get on the wrong side of China. So interesting that balance of power. Well, yeah, stuff I mean, I, I would say that it's shifted completely now. Even though America owns the World Bank, yeah. the thing is, China could just pull out its investments and tank America. So I'd say that China is pretty much in the driving seat, no matter what the West likes to think, because they've invested so heavily mm. in all the other countries that they could just tank their economies, not and just leave them completely bankrupt. So you know they're they're in the driving seat, and I'd say that they generally pay lip service pretending that America is still powerful and stuff because that's because it, I, they don't want to, they don't want to take number one position too quickly because they think there'll be a backlash, but it will happen over the next 20, 30 years. Yeah. I think anything is probably inevitable. Um, anywho. Um, so the Mongo believe that the Yoloko preventive charm has to be very strong as the spirits for whom they're meant are in some sense, not of this world. Mm. It's also not enough to just go into the forest because you have some charm. Mm. I think our friends at Face to Face Africa have pulled out a little joke there. Good on them. Um, but that's why yeah, I always not, go in the forest. Yeah, it's not about your personal charm. I mean, basically, you're you're going to get all the flesh off of your arms eaten off. Is what's going to happen here? Chris. Yeah, I know. But because you've squirrels... overestimated your charm, your personal charm <laughs> by, by personal some charm. by some degree. My personal charm, second to none. Secondly, they mean charm as in the sense of a magical charm that will protect you from evil. Well, I mean, I don't, I, I don't um, own any bells. Do you own a bell? It's more that you've got to be afraid of their bells. Because um, uh, if, you, if you hear bells are tingling, that means there's some magic. Oh, they've got bells. Oh, they've but got bells. You... And, they, and, they, and they're happy to use them, Chris. You're dancing around a, a question. A bunch of little campologists. Do, do, do I you own, own bells? Any bells? No, I don't. No, I don't. No, me neither. It used to be, people used to, my gran used to have some bells. And my mum's really? got a bell. Like, yeah, like a brass one, like an ornamental bell. I think my mum's got a brass one and also a porcelain one. Because I think because they're good, they're good luck or whatever. I think I don't. I've got um, okay. I've got a Tibetan singing bowl, 
got one of them. Maybe that would work. Don't know. Crossing the streams. Well, I think you'd have to find a sort of qualified charm maker. Do you reckon? Do you reckon the best thing to do if you're going? They ain't coming cheap. If you're going to, especially um, somebody with your lack of hunting prowess. Yeah, but with, and charm. Um, yeah. <laughs> but so, would you say that maybe the best people, if you were going to make an expedition to go and find an eloco, would be a town crier and maybe some Morris dancers, because they're. they're They've got bells of plenty. Could it? Ding a ling a ling. Ding ding. 